Hello, my name is Peter Parfit. Welcome to the New Brit Workshop and this Workshop Notes video. Now I've had some questions about uh, what construction technique I use for that barn that you may have seen in some of my videos. So I've put together a short piece about that. Uh, I've got a piece on uh, how to tidy up your bandsaw blades, which is at the end of the video and is worth watching. I'm also going to show you a quick method of squaring the capex and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this year's d &M show, which I went to at Kempton Park back in October. And I want to show you a very simple technique, uh, how when you're trying to put a rebate uh, with a router in narrow stock, uh, how uh, to keep your uh, router stable. And uh, then you may recall I've recently done something on this Husqvarna uh, leaf blower. Uh, I'm going to show you a little modification I've just made for it. Now this is the top uh, for the uh, CNC cabinet that I made and uh, this field here uh, is some uh, uh, nine millimeter thick MDF and around it is this edging which is no wider than this and the challenge I had uh, was to put a rebate all the way around uh, this finished frame of the top in order to take uh, that MDF and there was a very simple technique I used which allowed me to keep the writer steady on the top of the edging. And one way of overcoming that is to uh, put a piece of wood uh, on the side of the piece you're about to cut uh, to improve the amount of support for the writer. And that's what I've done here. Now you may well have seen my uh, recent introduction uh, to you of the Husqvarna uh, 125 BVX uh, leaf blower. I've got it here. Now one of the uh, features of it is that you can uh, put uh, different uh, bits of tubing on. Uh, this one is the blower tubing and there's some different tubing that goes on when you're using it as a vacuum. And in order to do those tube changes uh, there is this uh, little uh, bolt uh, that goes through just here and I found it quite fiddly using a screwdriver uh, in the head of that bolt uh, as I was playing around with the uh, bits of tubing trying to get them uh, located and in the end I thought it would be easier uh, to replace uh, this bolt with this uh, Bristol knob or Bristol bolt or Bristol catch it comes under a number of different names depending where you are in the world uh, but basically it's a lever device and it's got a thread here and uh, the top here is such that uh, you can pull it out and then it works like a ratchet uh, and so uh, you don't have to rotate it uh, through 100 or 360 degrees all the time you can just rotate it a bit and then let it come to rest and you can put this lever out of the way wherever you need so that's the uh, Bristol knob Bristol uh, lever uh, whatever it might be called where you are now if you look carefully this is the original bolt uh, that came with the Husqvarna and if I put the two side by side like this you can see how uh, easy it would be to replace this with that the only thing to remember is that uh, on this side of the machine uh, there is a captive nut uh, it's not the one you see there now it's beyond that and it's inside this uh, bit of plastic housing and that captive nut is what does the work when the uh, the lever or the the bolt is screwed in uh, here is the bolt and this is its head end uh, and it has the uh, provision for a screwdriver slot just here and then if you look and you can see where the plastic housing uh, fits in and you can then see there is a captive nut uh, just here uh, as part of the housing and at the very end there is this final retaining nut uh, which is there just to stop the bolt falling out if we now turn to the Bristol knob you can see how I constructed uh, this solution uh, the Bristol knob with its threaded portion uh, forms uh, the part that the bolt uh, originally did and then that gets screwed into uh, the uh, captive nut uh, which is uh, built into the plastic housing and then finally at the very end I, I put a retaining nut in my case I've used one of those nylock uh, nuts uh, which should stay on there uh, pretty satisfactorily 
And so the net result is that I can undo uh, this and then put my piece of tubing on. And then all I've got to do is tighten it up as simply as that. And I can now move this lever to whichever position I want so it's out of the way. A lot of people have asked about this barn, which I've shown in one or two uh, videos, and in particular, they've asked about the construction techniques used. So I thought I'd give you a very quick introduction to it now. Now, the first thing I did was to create some uh, footings on all uh, four sides of the barn, uh, and these are on a concrete base uh, with uh, some bricks on top and block work as well. And you can probably just about see a bit of the block, block work sticking up here. And then on top of that, I then placed the wall plate on three sides, uh, which the barn itself is built uh, upon. Now, the three sides of the barn are constructed in five pieces altogether. There's two pieces along each side of frame framework, and at the back, uh, there's a, a single framework for the whole uh, of that piece there. Up above, I've built separately uh, these uh, trusses, which were uh, then uh, brought on top of the framework once the framework was erected in place. Now getting everything uh, done with just myself and my wife was pretty tricky, um, but um, we managed it uh, using a bit of ingenuity. Uh, the, the main difficulty was, was raising uh, the sides up because they were so heavy. And for that reason, uh, the sides which should have been made out of uh, four batus uh, in every one of these uh, uh, vertical sections here uh, is actually made of uh, just four batu at each end and a four batu in the middle. And then these intermediate ones are two by two. Now, I realized at the time that that would not be strong enough. And so after the frame was in place, I then screwed on and glued on with waterproof glue uh, these pieces of one by two, uh, which are stiffening up uh, those uh, otherwise quite uh, uh, flimsy two by twos. Now, if I were constructing this again and I had help, uh, I would definitely make sure that these were four by twos as well. Now, with such large sides on the barn, uh, they needed to be stiffened up so that there was no risk uh, of the whole thing distorting in strong, strong winds. And so in the center section here, you see that I've got this uh, extra piece here of four by two uh, with some uh, uh, cross pieces. And this goes all the way up to the roof and it's designed to stop the middle section here, uh, bowing inwards uh, due to uh, high winds. And you can see that again on this side, uh, here's the uh, equivalent piece, it's a little more clear on this side, uh, and uh, uh, that's it. And it's bolted onto the join of the two pieces of framework on this side, uh, and it is set in concrete. There's a, uh, an angle iron here which goes down into concrete, uh, and so uh, this front edge is uh, pretty well supported. And it goes on up here all the way uh, to the roof section and you can see the ends of the bolts which are holding it in place all along. Looks like I had a little whoopsie there, cut that out and didn't need to, never mind. Now I've used similar uh, construction techniques for this end panel. It's uh, four by two at each end, four by two here, here and here and in between it's two by twos, uh, and again it's got these one by two add-ons done after it was erected, and those are uh, glued and screwed on. Everywhere, all these framework pieces have cross bracing, and uh, that is to make sure there's no uh, distortion in this plane. And if one looks up at the ceiling, you'll see that I've got these pieces of uh, plywood here and here on both sides and they run the full length and, and those are uh, stopping uh, any distortion in the horizontal plane. Now when it comes to checking the capex for square, which I do quite often, uh, there are a couple of ways of going about it which are uh, very easy. 
Uh, one is uh, detailed in the uh, US supplementary manual for the CAPEX, and it's a, a really excellent document, and I do recommend it to you. Uh, and that you uh, suggest you use a piece of wood, you number uh, the edges, one, two, three, and four, and then you do a series of cuts, and then uh, see how far off uh, that is from square uh, by the time you've done the final cut. Uh, now, I'm not going to describe that method any further, but there's one simple method uh, which I use. Now, I take a, a reasonably wide piece of wood, and this is a piece of MDF. Uh, it's got a very straight edge here. I've checked it, uh, and uh, it's probably about uh, 200 uh, millimetres this way. And what I do is with the machine in the zero position, in other words, it should be cutting a right angle, I do a cut. And after I've done the cut, I have just done one uh, now, uh, I check for square, and I'm using my large engineer's square. And you may just be able to see a tiny bit of light coming from that area there. So it's cutting a little bit too much there, so it means that uh, this uh, central adjustment area needs to move that way a fraction. There are three screws, one here, one there, and one there. I loosen those three. I leave everything locked down. Now after a while you'll get to be able to judge how much you need to do this. And I've got a, a soft-ended uh, part here on my little screwdriver and I'm just going to give that a little tap. And then I'm going to tighten it up again. And now I'm going to do a test cut. I'm making sure that this is properly up against the rear fence. And now we measure again. And I don't know if it's clear here, but that is now super. It's good enough for me. So all I need to do now is do a final tighten up of these three screws. And that's the job done. Very quick and very simple. Now I go along to the DNM show, which held in October. Uh, each year at Kempton Park, and this year I actually met Paul Dowding, uh, who's running the business. Now, it was his mum and dad, uh, David and Mary, uh, who started the business a while ago, uh, hence the D and M. Uh, I met Paul's sister, Liz, there as well. So it was all uh, a family-run show, and it's extremely good. I got to look at some of the latest tools, uh, I got to talk to some of the dealers, uh, and there was a lot to see. It was a very worthwhile day out. Now I really enjoyed my annual fix of some of these manufacturers who produce such wonderful kit like Wera. Wera tools are absolutely brilliant. Uh, I had a jolly good look at the Festool stand of course and I made a beeline at the very beginning for the Bessie clamps. I was changing bandsaw blades the other day and someone asked me uh, how I uh, tidied up the bandsaw blade I had just taken off. Um, I wear protective gloves, uh, eye protection, uh, you might wish to also have face protection. Uh, hold the bandsaw blade uh, with your palms upwards like this and then twist inwards like so. And that's it done. Give it a little shake so it evens out the, the curves and that then will stay together quite nicely. I actually put a little uh, spring clip around here uh, when it's not in use. And there's the finished bandsaw blade uh, which has got some uh, little, little bits of uh, stuff around it to stop it coming uncoiled. Now that was pretty easy to do and I, I think you'll find it's not such a difficult task after all. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.